What were you doing in there? I'm making sure they clean Don Long's vent. Don't want one more person getting a super bug. It might be too late for that. In March 2020, an episode of a Fox Network television show called The Resident appears about a lethal fungus spreading through a fictional hospital. The fungus has an ability to attack people with underlying conditions, such as diabetes. The hospital staff go to great pains to try to get rid of the infection without causing panic or revealing their own mistakes. Canada, or is highly dangerous in immune-compromised patients. Half the people who get it die. The coronavirus actually makes a brief appearance in the episode. We're lucky it's not airborne like the coronavirus. The staff is not at risk, but the patients could be. But it doesn't really figure into the plot. Anyway, one of the writers behind this episode is named Daniela Lamas. And around the time it airs, the episode starts to feel like reality for her. That's because in addition to being a TV show scriptwriter, she's an ICU doctor at Brigham and Women's Hospital in Boston. And there was initially this sort of odd feeling of, you know, truth being stranger than fiction and, and sort of feeling slow to kind of realize that this was real. You know, I have friends who work in New York. Like we saw what was happening there. But um, even so, it, it took a little bit of time to, to, to realize, oh, my gosh, like this, is, this is happening. Reality was following an alternative script in which a coronavirus was the arch villain. Swathed in PPE, Lamas was taking care of patients with a previously unknown disease, COVID-19. Hundreds across Massachusetts became sick with the disease, piling into the hospital in unforeseen numbers. Brigham and Women's has a 16-floor patient tower, but across the street there's a newer cardiology building with a number of rooms with negative airflow. That can be useful for keeping viruses under control. So the cardiology building became a COVID facility. It was in one of those rooms that Lamas took care of a patient she'll never forget. There's a room that will always be a guy in his 30s with developmental delay who got COVID in his group home and who was on a lung bypass machine to keep him alive. But when it was clear that that was not going anywhere, and we had to tell his mother that that he was was going to die. And she asked us not to take him off the machine on Mother's Day, which was a Sunday. So we waited till Monday morning. And I was off that Monday morning. It was no longer my time on service. Normally, interns in training were generally kept at a distance from COVID patients because of the risk of catching the disease. But on the morning that Lamas's patient died, she wasn't in the hospital. So an intern who had been involved in his care put on protective gloves, a gown and mask and went into the room with him. And she held the phone to uh, his ear and, you know, his family said goodbye and told him apparently what heaven would be like. And I remember she heard telling her me that that night and I you know, felt so sort of guilty that she had been in there and, and gotten that you know, experience. Um, but also she said it was good because she realized she had never really seen the patient before because we, we kept the interns from examining from being in the rooms as possible. You know, we sort of did the exams as attendings. And so she was like, I'd been caring for him for weeks. And this was the first time I saw his face. And so sort of those moments, I think, you know, are things that will always be in our minds. Even doctors had difficulty believing what they were seeing happen in front of their eyes. COVID was changing everything. But there was a big difference from Lamas' show, where doctors were trying to hide the infection in the hospital. Now they were trying desperately to make clear to the rest of the world what was really happening within their walls and how COVID was changing the rules. Khalid Ishmael is a colleague of Lamas's who specializes in taking care of lung disorders. There's like a big, you know, conspiracy and all. I think once we start to hear these things on the outside and see what's happening on the inside, I mean, I think that really affected, you know, the way I see things. And, you know, I usually don't post much on, on social media. And I, and I went actually and I had like a post about people, please listen and please follow, you know, recommendations for prevention and PPE and mask and social distancing and all of that. Now, Lamas and Ismail are both working in a Brigham clinic where they take care of people with long COVID, a mysterious syndrome that can affect people months after they've been infected, even if their cases aren't serious. Bit by bit, COVID is altering the space where they work. Hospitals have long occupied a singular place in the community and in the imagination. They're a place where discoveries are made, where friends and relatives come to be with the sick, where medical miracles can happen. But that's changing. Increasingly, hospitals are becoming fortresses that must carefully limit who enters and who exits. 
No matter how many gowns and masks they have now, workers are feeling overburdened with caring for COVID patients who may stay for months, needing highly intensive care. Miracles are getting harder and harder to perform, and many healthcare workers now feel less trusted than ever before. I'm John Lowerman, and I'm a journalist with Bloomberg News. From the Prognosis Podcast, this is Breakthrough. Brigham and Women's, the hospital where scriptwriter Daniela Lamas works as a doctor, is one of the most storied in the world. It can trace its history back almost 200 years when it was one of the first American maternity hospitals. Brigham doctors actually developed the idea of the intensive care unit in the 1950s. Here in Boston um, and at the Brigham, yes, we definitely have critically ill unvaccinated patients, but not to the extent that there are in other places in the country. You know, our vaccine rates are, are good here in Massachusetts. And there are some outlying hospitals who have been a lot more hit than we are. My father's a doctor in Miami, and so the hospital he works at is just full of unvaccinated, super sick, unvaccinated COVID. And, and I think, you know, there's a, a different tone to it. The pandemic is making health workers feel like they're on an island. On the outside, the hospital looks pretty much the same as it always did. The banners, the glass and steel, the emergency room parking lot. On the inside, it's become a very different place, one of constant stress and worry and feeling like there's no way out. Late this summer, Idaho was overrun with COVID cases. At one point, there were more than 600 people hospitalized. That's about 20% more than in December when COVID was running rampant across the U.S., and vaccines weren't yet available. Staffing shortages were limiting hospitals' ability to provide good standards of care. Even today, only 42% of Idaho residents are fully vaccinated. Washington's Governor Jay Inslee appealed to Idaho residents to wear masks because the Idaho crisis was spreading west into his state. Jim Souza is a pulmonologist at St. Luke's Hospital in Ketchum, Idaho. He says it's difficult to find enough beds and to keep them staffed. We're, we're just experiencing an unprecedented uh, wave of acute illness. And that acute illness is all COVID. And it is almost exclusively in uh, unvaccinated uh, individuals. I checked this statistic right before our interview today. And... Um, Of our intensive care unit patients who are in the hospital uh, with COVID, uh, 96% of them are unvaccinated. There's a small handful that are vaccinated, including organ transplant patient, uh, cancer patient, and, and so on. On the Zoom call, Jim looks tired. He talks about constantly donning and doffing personal protective equipment as he and his team go from one sick room to the next. Jim also says the actual interior of the hospital has had to change to accommodate more COVID patients, just like Brigham and Women's. This wave has has caused us to uh, change where we're providing care. So we've opened up surge uh, units. We had one surge unit, which was a cardiac observation unit that we turned into a nine-bed intensive care unit. We filled it today. But still, more COVID patients come in the door. And today is, this day is probably going to be the day that we spill over into our um, next surge unit, which is a a telemetry unit. And, uh, you know, for those who know something about this, intensive care unit rooms are specifically designed to meet the needs of those patients. Very large rooms to accommodate all of the machinery, equipment, monitoring, et, et cetera, that's needed all of the people that might need to be in the room to care for a patient. A telemetry room is not designed for that, but we're going we're gonna to do our best. Adding to all this, though, is the open hostility that he and other workers encounter. Some patients tell him that COVID is a hoax, and they demand that the word be kept out of their relatives' death certificates. Many of these people have been getting their information about COVID from different sources, Jim says. So they come with a different mental model about this disease. 
and they come with a different belief system about this disease. And as they do that, they're coming with a bit more hostility, which, which I, I got to say is a really unique thing in healthcare. We are very used to taking care of all comers. I mean, we, right, we take care of we take care of lots of folks who have chronic problems that they've decided not to manage. Doctors don't resent patients for their beliefs about COVID, Jim says. We take care of, you know, prisoners. We, we take care of uh, good people, bad people. <laughs> we just take care of people. That's our job. And what, what helps you have that sort of um, cool indifference to the, um, the individual characteristics of the patient you're caring for is the fact that almost all of the time, what you get back from the patient is an overwhelming sense of appreciation for the efforts being applied to try to return them to health. So to be met with hostility is unusual. And I, I don't want you to think that that is pervasive, but even when in small doses, it, it, it does take a toll. And then there are the meetings of the school board. We were invited by the school board and the request was to speak about the um, wisdom of a mask requirement as they started school, um, whether we, we should or shouldn't do that. And, and we shared our pros and cons and we were not going to share an opinion unless they asked for it and they did ask for it. And you know, the, the it's just jeers, boos, those jeers and boos came after Jim and his colleague recommended the use of masks in schools. Jim wasn't able to actually see the audience, but his wife was at the meeting in person and told him afterwards what she'd seen. The moderator did an excellent job, by the way. She, it was a, she was trying to mitigate that. And what, the way she did that, and my wife's a school teacher, so she, had, she admired this technique. She said it was a very school teacher-y type thing to do is she said, look, I, I know people are gonna have different opinions about what our experts are saying. You know, if, if you don't like it, you can kind of do this. Jim is waving his hands. If you like it, you can do this. Now he's giving a thumbs up. So apparently while we were talking, there was all kinds of crazy gesticulation happening in the audience, you know. That sense of disconnectedness between hospitals and the communities they care for has perhaps never been so strong or uncomfortable. It's making the job of working in a hospital harder all the time. And this means healthcare workers are starting to burn out and leave. That threatens to create an entirely new crisis in hospital understaffing. Wendy Dean is the co-founder of a group called Moral Injury of Healthcare. The group focuses on healthcare workers who, they say, are forced to work under conditions that violate their sense of right and wrong. She says COVID has pushed that to a boiling point, and hospitals are the focus. It is a much less comfortable space. That's what I'm hearing from across the country. I'm hearing more, more clinicians now who say, I cried all the way to work. I didn't want to get up this morning. I love my job. I usually love my job. I, I don't want to go to work. It's too hard. It's too much. Watching 30-year-olds on ventilators that you know have a 30% chance or a 35% chance of not getting off, that is excruciating. And we don't just leave it when we walk out of the hospital. One of the key points of frustration is vaccination. Many people... About 95% of those coming to the hospital with COVID have refused to get shots. Doctors and nurses still feel compassion for them, but the frustration is extreme. There are all kinds of reasons why patients can't get the vaccine or don't have access to it. But at the same time, it's frustrating to us that we can't make it more available and that we can't, that no matter how, how much we um, encourage people to get it, or ask them to come with us, come to us with questions, that it's that turning that corner so that there's there's less vaccine hesitancy 
um, has been really hard. And I, and I think that is, that's becoming more frustrating for healthcare workers. Doctors are often at pains to help people understand that COVID isn't a fantasy, that it can be life-altering or even lethal, and that it's threatening their lives every day. Katie Miro Johnson is an infectious disease doctor in Denver, where hospitals have also been hit hard. She says she recently bumped into a neighbor on the street whose friend was sick with COVID and on a ventilator. The neighbor asked Johnson how she thought her friend might do. I looked at her, I said, he's probably going to die. I said, there's, there's very low chance he's going to survive. Johnson says her neighbor's face went white. I feel bad walking away from that, that I was so honest, but I said, she asked what was, what, what I thought, because I think people are asking, what do you think about this? And if I say something such as that, they're going to die. You know, um, it scares people. It, it, they don't know how to grasp that that's a possibility, and that's hard. The neighbor's friend was only in his 40s and with no underlying medical problems. But there's often little that can be done by the time someone is on a ventilator. I don't want to be that person. <laughs> it, it feels hard to... Uh, um, for them to look at me in a, a, the, the same way, you know, with saying things like that. Um, but when you're around it every day, um, I don't, you know, I, I don't feel it as uh, that gravity that they do. It's a strange feeling for doctors not being able to be heard. They're used to being the voice of authority, the last word on medical issues and experts on life and death. But this is how it is in the time of COVID. One reality inside the hospital and one outside and not enough communication in between. And I think, you know, going forward, um, there is a disconnect still with, um, there's a substantial amount of people getting admitted with these long 60-day hospital admissions unvaccinated and we are using our highest resources possible to keep them alive. And, um, and it's hard. Um, it's hard. Um, ventilatory support, you know, IV medicines daily and, um, some of them taking a flight for life plane from other, you know, other States even to come here, which is, you know, um, which is desperate, which is, uh, yeah, that's kind of what we're what we're dealing with now. Just a few months ago, it looked like the pandemic would fade, at least in the U.S., as vaccines rolled out. So far, that hasn't happened in the states where vaccine uptake is low. Unvaccinated people, particularly those with chronic illnesses, are still getting sick. Kate says there's still a lack of good treatments to take care of people who get really sick. I, uh, I think from the, the health care provider standpoint, um, we want this to be over um, just as much as everyone else does. Um, and um, I do think that if we can increase vaccination worldwide, uh, which is the goal, is the only way we're going to bring this to an end um, and protect all of our most vulnerable people um, in the U.S., um, from continually to be, you know, come into the hospital, be sick, and then ultimately die. Um, and so um, I think from our standpoint, we, we, we're giving treatments that we have high quality evidence for, uh, but are not willing to risk uh, using other things that um, have low quality evidence or, or are negative, have negative studies behind them. And um, I think that um, if there was something that we thought would cure someone, we would be giving it. Drugs with poor quality evidence behind them include ivermectin and hydroxychloroquine. Hydroxychloroquine is a drug for malaria that was touted by former President Donald Trump as a cure for COVID early in the pandemic when there were even fewer options than there are now. Studies have shown it doesn't work, but there is still a large segment of the population that puts its trust in the drug. Ivermectin is another drug for parasites that hasn't shown effectiveness, but 
Many patients and their families come into hospitals demanding it. Katie says the controversies over COVID treatment are eroding trust in hospitals and health professionals. I still think that we are used as a a way to take care of acute illness and hopefully turn it around. But I do think people, certainly a certain um, subtype or or subpopulation of, of folks are not coming to the hospital because they're worried that somehow the hospital is going to make them worse. Now, doctors sometimes have a hard time treating patients because of mistrust. No matter where they're cared for, patients who do get sick are very worried and often mistrustful. What we have is an invisible war, uh, and where the war is being conducted is on the insides of the hospitals and in our clinics. Those places are on fire right now with sick patients, but the rest of the community doesn't see that. That's Ted Epperly, a doctor and CEO of a residency program based in Boise. When we talked, Idaho had the second lowest vaccination rate of any state. And residents were just starting to return to events like state fairs and football games, most of them unmasked. I was a a family medicine physician in the the Army for 21 years. I've been in a war in the first Gulf War and did a lot of work in the Gulf War uh, at a MASH hospital with emergencies. Um, And um, the, the analogy I like to use for this is that if tanks were rumbling down the streets here and there were bombs going off, planes flying over and helicopters, smoke, fire, everybody would get it. And everybody would be appropriately concerned and pulling together as a team. Uh, That's not happening. Ted says the invisibility and isolation of hospitals' plight is particularly deep in some very rural, very conservative communities. People are kind of, you know, stacking up like logwood, like cordwood in the... um, uh, in their uh, waiting areas, uh, they've had fairly significant um, amounts of bad cases that are right in front of them that they can't do much for. And what that leads to is a sense of both isolation, uh, fear, and loneliness. Um, they feel like they're out on an island um, trying to manage all of this. And with all the resources the United States has to offer around them, but not being able to get anything accomplished. So it's that that sense of disillusionment that the whole system is kind of shutting down and breaking uh, that I think is part of the, uh, the dynamic and the tragedy of this that we're going through in Idaho right now. Ted says he thinks this could be the case for a long time. I think this could go on for quite a while. And what I mean for quite a while, uh, maybe 25 to 40 years. Um, And I know that sounds almost like you got to be kidding. That just sounds unbearable. But Ted studies pandemics and says some have lasted from 40 to 100 years. Now, science and technology wasn't like it was back in those times. But we currently have another pandemic simultaneously ongoing that's been ongoing for 40 years already, simultaneously. That's the HIV uh, epidemic pandemic. We've not resolved that. And the reason we haven't is that we haven't developed a vaccine for it. Um, What could happen in this scenario? Because we only have about 3 to 4% of the world uh, that's been vaccinated. A key problem is the lack of access to vaccination in many parts of the world and resistance to it in the U.S. It's a very low percent is that um, this continues to reverberate uh, in populations of people with low vaccination rates and new variants um, get spun off of that reverberation so that different variants continue to slam populations. We have one, as you well know now, called the Mu variant that's coming out of South America that has immune evasion properties, which means that (laughs) the vaccines And the plasma, the serum plasma that we have right now may be ineffective against this variant, meaning that we go through another whole cycle 
of infection and illness only to spawn another variant uh, that kicks off from the process. So um, the optimist in me, and I tend to be an optimist, um, would like to see this resolve in 18 months to 24 months. The, the potential realist in me uh, really says that this could be 20 to 25 to 40 year experience that we all just learn to manage. Jim Souza, the Idaho pulmonologist, has been trying to get local politicians to come to St. Luke's and see what's really happening. He says many have had their eyes opened and gone back out to the community to talk about the desperate situation in hospitals. But another thing he wants them to talk about is vaccination and its benefits, because that's the only way he and his colleagues see out of this situation. I'd like them to talk about the fact that this is real. I mean, there's all this stuff on social media that our hospitals are filled with patients who have gotten the vaccine and gotten COVID from that. And that's why I'm like, people are pulling that this stuff out. Of, I'm talking thin air here. So talk about it's real. Talk about your own vaccine. That separation between what people say outside the hospital and what actually happens inside between beliefs and scientific facts remains a huge challenge to hospitals and their workers. At the end of Daniela Lamas' resident episode, the vital information about the deadly fungus gets out. People start to take precautions and things go back to normal, more or less. That's what Lamas would like to see happen with COVID, but it may take a long time. It ended and tied with a bow, though, so that's the difference between fiction and and reality <laughs> said when you're tired of a plot line you can say let's put that one to bed let's just move on and here we are unable to do that caring for deathly ill contagious patients with a poorly understood disease is always a difficult job an absence of trust makes it even harder covid is not only doing damage to patients it could poison the atmosphere of many hospitals for years to come Next week on Breakthrough, we're going to look at how COVID revolutionized medicine with the development of the mRNA vaccines. We'll meet Katalin Kariko, a Hungarian biochemist whose decades of early work, sometimes making just a dollar an hour, paved the way for vaccines that could go from idea to immunization in just a year. This was incredible. Yeah, this was uh, just breathtaking. And... Uh, in this moment, we understood, hey, there's a vaccine for mankind, and corona is, is a problem that can be solved. That's next time on Breakthrough. This episode of Prognosis Breakthrough was written and reported by me, John Lauerman. Topher Forges is our senior producer. Carl Kevin Robinson Jr. is our associate producer. Our theme music was composed and performed by Hannes Brown. Rick Shine is our editor. Francesca Levy is the head of Bloomberg Podcasts. Be sure to subscribe if you haven't already. And if you like this episode, please leave us a review. It helps others find out about the show. Thanks for listening. Thank you.